I've got some stuff that confuses me, and I thought I'd show it, but without someone to play with the computer at the back, I couldn't show you how confused I am. That, I, have you ever seen signs that are supposed to be there to help you, and you think, hmm, not sure? Next one, first one, Sam. Free Wi-Fi, starting at 59.99. <laughs> yeah, um, very confused. <laughs> Next one. No, dogs allowed. <laughs> what does that sign actually mean? <laughs> it's uh, totally confusing. Next one. Uh, secret nuclear bunker. Uh, how secret can you get? Thing is, I actually know the guy who actually designed that sign and called it that. He did it for a reason, so because it was meant as a joke. But this next one is on the same theme, but was not a joke. <laughs> and do you know want to know where I saw this? This is my own photo, okay? This photo was taken near Ground Zero a week after 9-11. Seriously, it was. 2001, 9-11 happened. We were there giving out some food to the people who live locally who couldn't get stuff. And there's, and there's the United States Secret Service Command Center. <laughs> it's just... How secret. The, first, the last one was a joke, but that one was absolutely serious. The next one, this confuses me. Baby changing room. Now... You who actually read that and, and read it, what it's, what it's meant to say, are quite happy. But I take things quite literally. Excuse me, sir. This baby cries a lot and it's filled its nappy again. Can I change it for a clean new one that doesn't cry a lot? <laughs> I've never seen anyone change their baby in one of those places. Much as we might want to. I do realise, actually, though, it's... Not about changing the baby, it's about changing the nappy. So why don't they say nappy changing room? It would make it easier for people like me who are very literal. But what actually is meant by that is this is a place to actually improve the baby's life. And guess what? We have a father who wants to improve our life as well. And he uses a few similar things. Because if you take a baby in to change its nappy, there's a few things you want to do. You want to clean it up, you want to make it feel better, and you want to make it attractive to others. Um, but that's what our Father wants to do with us. He wants to make us attractive. We move on. That's the end of the photos. Thanks, Sam. God actually wants to make us unstoppable people, give us unstoppable lives. But there's some things that actually needs to happen. And... Paul in the Bible is a great guy to look at for this. I like, his, I like guy, the guy. He's got a good name. He's, uh, all, the people, all the best people in the world have, these, have, good, have a good name like that. But he was not what you would call a great guy when he started. He was a pain in the rear for the church of God. Um, it says in Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul, which is Paul's other name, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, i.e. they were Christians, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Nice guy, really, isn't he? As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul! Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. I think I might have been ready if I'd have seen that happen. And just heard this voice out of nowhere. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. 
The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. But he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, uh, I've heard some reports about this guy. Um, he's a bit dodgy. He's causing problems for everyone. In, in Jerusalem, many of the Christians, he's affected. He's come here with, he's got authority from all the chief priests and he's going to arrest anyone who called on your name and that kind of includes me, God. I don't really want to do this. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. This is the start of Paul being transformed, having his life transformed. And just for anyone, any confusion, Saul and Paul mean exactly the same thing. Some people think, oh, he had his name changed when he became a Christian. No, he didn't. OK, the Latin for Saul is Paul. That's all it is. It's not a change of name. So sometimes you'll hear him called Paul, sometimes Saul. Doesn't matter. Same guy. It's not like it like some of the people in the Old Testament had their names changed by God. This was just his name. But God picked him up and he basically cleaned him up. How does God clean up people? Well, he does the same for you and for me to clean us. Right at the start, it starts up with a clean up because we as humans are all dirty. Sin is the word. We all know the word. We've done stuff that's not up to God's standard. It makes us unclean. It makes us separated from God. And God's thinking, I want to keep these as my friends. I want to bring them into life with me. How can I do it? They're unclean. How can I wash them? The only way we can forgive sin is by sacrifice, but there's not enough animals in the world for every sin. These people, so Jesus came to earth. God came as, to earth as Jesus. Chose to be nailed to the cross and take our forgiveness. And that's how he starts to clean us up, because he takes away the dirt of sin in our lives and cleans it from us. That's what us saying, yes, I want to become a Christian. I want to follow you. I want forgiveness because of what you've done, Jesus. That starts the cleaning process. And that's what happens when you take a baby into the changing station, the changing room. You start off by just cleaning them up and get freshening them up. And that's what God wants to do with us. But how do we know that that's what happened to Paul? Because it doesn't actually say that Paul decided he was going to follow the gospel and become saved. It doesn't actually say that. What it actually says was, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptised. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. The important point there is he was baptised. Baptism was an outward sign to everyone around you. This is what I'm doing. I'm following this God. I am following Jesus. I'm accepting that my forgiveness comes from him. So although it doesn't say Saul prayed the repentance prayer and says, God, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I'll accept Jesus died for my sins. The fact that he chose to be baptised shows that he must have prayed that. So we know that God started off with transforming Paul's life by cleaning him up. And if you haven't met God fully yet, he wants to clean all of us up. It's open for everybody. If you're watching this on the internet and you've seen this sermon, and you've not given your life to Jesus, I just want to challenge you. Come to God and say, I want to be cleaned up because he's there for you. He's there for me. And it's an open gift. Paul, at that time, though, thought he was really was pleasing God. Because he was doing what he thought God wanted. He thought God wanted everyone who didn't follow all the rules and the these and the eyes and, the, and do everything in exactly the right way. They were against God and he was going to go and destroy them. And he thought he was pleasing God. But God was actually saying, no, coming to me, being cleaned, is not about following rules. It's about knowing me. It's not our good stuff. It's not our clever deeds. It's not all the good stuff we do for God, like Paul thought, that makes it. It's coming to him and saying... I want to follow you. I accept my forgiveness is through you. That's where you get cleaned. Not by going out there and doing everything you think God wants you to do. God wants to clean us all up. And that's the invitation. Becoming a Christian takes us to the first level. God started to clean us. 
But then, when you take a baby into the changing room, you actually want to make them feel a bit better, don't you? You don't, because the baby starts to feel a bit uncomfortable. Now, this is not from personal experience. I have never changed a nappy. I've held a few babies and wanted to give them back, but I've never actually changed a nappy. But my understanding is that after a while, if you leave a baby in a dirty nappy, it's going to get uncomfortable. It's, they're going to feel pretty, pretty rough. But that's what God wants to do with us. He doesn't just want to take us and clean us up. He wants to make us feel better. He wants to take our life and make us feel pleased with it, ready to go forwards, give us a, a vision, a future. Just becoming a Christian isn't always going to be everything you need. Coming and being baptised isn't going to do everything for you. That's part of the process, but it's not it. Volunteering to help out a church when Mark says, we've got a work day on next Saturday or Sunday, and you're volunteering for it. Volunteering to do anything at church isn't going to make you feel better. Doing stuff is not the answer. What makes you feel better is your time with God, being with God, letting him into your life and direct you. Um, in science, my wife Trudy's a scientist and she's, she's got honours degree in science. That's further than I ever went. But when you're doing experiments in chemistry, you've got methods and you've got results. Okay. Now, some methods work better than others to get the results you want. I just want to ask you a simple question. If you wanted to get a method to feel better, I've got two options here. Which do you think is going to work better? Do more stuff for God so you can get closer to him. That's one way of trying to feel better. Or spend time with God, let him talk to you and lead you and do the stuff he leads you to do. Which one's going to work better? Second one. We all know that. We're all nodding our heads here and saying, yeah, I agree, Paul. You're right. That's exactly what I thought. But how many of us have lived our life at times thinking, I've just got to do some stuff. I've got to volunteer. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. We all know stuff in theory. I know stuff in theory, how to change a baby's nappy. I've just never done it. And I'll let other people do it. But just because you know things in theory and you never do it doesn't matter. Are you actually going to say, I'm going to get close to you, God, let you transform my life from within and then move me on and direct me? Then I'm going to start to feel better. Option one will kind of work for a while. I'll, I'll tell you that. If you start doing stuff for God, you're going to feel quite good because you're going to feel a bit self-righteous and not, I'm good, I'm a volunteer and, and Mark or, or someone will be saying, thank you very much for helping out, which is really good. And you're going to feel good. But the problem is, if you're, not, you're getting so busy doing stuff, you're not spending time with God. When the problems of this life come along, anybody ever have problems? Am I talking to the people who never have problems? So, no. All right, we've got some problems here. Okay, so I can, I can carry on. You'll know what I'm talking about. There are going to be some situations in your life that are going to get on your wick, shall we say politely, and they're going to start to stress you. And if you're just busy and doing things for God, there's going to come a tipping point when you're just going to lose it. It might just be you'll have a whinge at God and then stop bothering going to church. And, or it might be that somebody in church says something to you and they've just been winding you up for the last six months. And every week they're saying, well, why didn't you do it that way? And it's just that point and you're going to and you flip. However it is, you just trying to do everything and be clever and make yourself feel good by what you're doing and feel better is never going to be enough. I promise you. What is going to be enough is getting in with God getting to know him, talking to him, letting him talk to you, letting him direct your life. You're going to feel better because you're going to feel rewarded. You're going to feel that you're doing something that's worthwhile. And my wife, Trudy, is a brilliant av advertisement for that. She had a really good job because she's, she's got a degree in chemistry. She was working in a chemistry lab. She was doing all the stuff she was good at, and she was analysing waste and saying this should happen, that should happen and stuff that sounds really good and it's all good stuff and somebody needs to do it but she actually just felt this isn't for me this isn't where i feel rewarded where i feel comfortable and so she gave it up and went and did a job looking after people for a living didn't earn loads of money but it's where she feels that she's fulfilled she's doing what she's called to do and when we stop doing what we think we should do and start doing what we're called to do by god 
That's when it's going to make a difference in your life. That's when you're going to be transformed into a more relaxed person. That's when you're going to become a less stressed person. That's when you're going to be transformed into what God has called you to be. I want to ask you, do you want to be what you think you should be or do you want to be what God has called you to be? Because I'm going to tell you which one works better. I'm coming back to the fact, if you want to actually be transformed by God, you've got to spend time with him. If you want a transformed life, if you want to be used by God, you're going to have to spend some time with God. But okay, it's great, that's a nice theory. Is that what happens in the Bible? Well, if you have a look at, at Saul's life, um, it says that after he'd, he'd been, uh, that God had spoken to him, it says Saul got up from the ground, when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So he did by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias and come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. This guy's only just got to know God three days and what do you spend those three days doing praying spending time with God Paul made that choice to actually get serious with God I want to ask you do you want your life to be transformed into something better are you going to get serious with God because that's going to make the difference that will transform your life that's how you will feel better as well as be better the problem is as Mark was saying just just before I came on, Mark was saying about we've got to make choices. It's a choice. You can actually carry on living your life as you are and you'll still be a Christian. You'll still be cleaned and cleaned up a little bit every time you come to church, maybe because you'll feel a bit better before you go home. But your life's not going to reach what it could be. You're not going to be transformed if you're just going to be who you want to be. You've got to make a choice. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to be hearing from God. I'm going to be what he wants me to be. I am going to be living my life with God, not for God. Living your life with God means it automatically becomes for God. But just living for God, God's a bit irrelevant. You're just doing bits for him, you think. I want to say, live your life with God, it's going to do more. Because I want to say, as that starts to happen, you spend time with God, it starts to affect your life. There's going to be certain things that change in your life. You're going to get confidence. Eh? Confidence. I'm, I'm always nervous. I never want to do anything. I see other people. I'm never going to be one of those people who goes out and does stuff. But when you know that you're in the calling of what God's called you to do, what God's saying to you, the touch God's putting on your life. He's going to give you that confidence because you know you're going where he's called you. So you know it's not just a good idea, you know it's a good idea. And which one works better, a good idea or a good idea? As you then start in working with God, you're going to get a positive attitude. Why a more positive attitude? We're feeling good, you're feeling happy. You're generally more positive about things that are going on around you. But then God's going to be showing you, if you're spending time with God, when you see things, God's going to be showing his vision of what you see. He's going to be transforming the way you look at things, your eyesight, your ears are going to hear things differently. You're going to hear them from God's perspective. And then you can be more, more positive. If you never feel good and you ne think everything around you is negative and everything's disaster, can I just tell you, you're not spending enough time with God because he hasn't rubbed off on you enough. If you want to have a better attitude to life and feel more positive, spend time with God. Let him start to transform your life, transform your thinking. Say to God, look, God, I can't understand this. This makes no sense to me. This is wrong. And let's say, God, talk to me, lead me, build me. And get God speaking into you and showing you his view on it. It's going to change the way you look at things. And you know something that I saw in Paul that he'd never had before? Because he spent time with God, he got a heart for other people. As before he came to know God personally, he just had a load of rules and things that he had to do. And he just had to destroy anyone who wasn't up to the, the right standard. But after he got to know God, he was building people up to that standard. You've got this standard, you've got God up here and you've got most people here. Now, the old way of Paul working was anybody who's not up high enough, nearer to God, let's just get rid of them, destroy them, put them in prison. But then after he came to know God personally, God says, no, you don't get rid of them. You take the people who aren't there yet and you build them. You build them. You lift them up. 
And this has transformed Paul from a person who's knocking, knocking people down, cutting them down, to someone who's building people up and trying to transform them and build their lives. It's not just his life that's transformed. He wants to transform other people's lives. Do you want to just transform yourself or would you like to see people around you transformed? That's the calling from God. But you know, when you get this, God's starting to make you feel better, there's actually certain things that rubs off on you. And the Bible has this way of describing some things. In Galatians chapter 5, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. You spend time with God. You start hearing from God. He's going to start changing your view on things. Instead of looking at someone and saying, why am I seeing someone drinking beer at nine in the morning? No matter, terrible person. You're thinking, what's happened to that person to get them to the place where that's the only way they can survive the day? It's a change of mindset. You're seeing things differently. And God's saying, I want to give you the heart for people. I want to give you that compassion. That kindness, that goodness, that gentleness. Self-control of your feelings. God doesn't just want to make us feel better like the parent wants to make the baby feel better and takes them into the changing room. He wants to make us a better person. He wants to transform our lives. But there's something else that happens that's quite important about taking the baby into the changing room. He makes the, the parent will make the baby more attractive to other people. As I mentioned earlier, I have occasionally been given a baby to hold, which I don't mind. Some people seem to think I never hold babies. I don't mind, but there is a point at which I hand them back. It's when I actually start to notice an aroma, and there's this sudden squidgy feeling in the nappy. It's, I'm thinking, where's mummy or daddy? It's time to hand them back. The baby's less attractive to me at that point. When I can just go, oh, coo. That's lovely but they're less attractive. The problem is, not everything about ourselves is attractive. Have you ever noticed there are some things that other people see in you, occasionally they think, hmm, hmm. God wants to make you attractive to other people. And I don't mean attractive as in, hi girls, I'm here. <laughs> Just in case anyone gets confused, because... I only want to be attractive that way to my wife, and I'm not available to anyone else. But God wants to make me attractive in that people want to come and talk to me. People want to share with me their problems so I can say, I can say, I'll pray for you. I'll talk to you about God. That's what God wants. Parents want to make their babies more attractive. There's two reasons. They want the best for the baby, and they want... And the babies are a reflection of the parents. Are you a reflection of your father in heaven? Because you should be attractive in the same way God's attractive. We were made in God's image. That's what the Bible says. But sometimes we kind of avoid the image bit and we live our life and we kind of like react as we feel like it. Paul at the start of this, was a reflection of the religion he was within. He was in a religion that was based on rules and do this, do that, build on things, and if you don't do things perfectly, you're not good enough. That was, he was reflecting. But then he came, God spoke to him, touched his life, and he started to reflect God. And so Paul did really become attractive to others. In fact, he intentionally made himself attractive to others, that people wanted to listen to what he says. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Starting at verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, I was without law. Not being without law to all God, but under law to all Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. 
Notice that phrase at the end, with you. It's a, it's a group thing. We should be living like that. We should be what people around us need us to be, to reflect God. God wants us to transform us into something that people look at and feel jealous of. How many people do you know that would look at you and think, I wish I was a bit like, or do they think I'm glad I'm not you? <laughs> Which vision reflects God? Which one is God making us more attractive to the people around us? I want to challenge you. Are you trying to make yourself attractive to people? The thing is, when God wants to change us and make us more attractive to people, you start to think, well, he's got to make me, stop me being Paul and make me into Mark, because Mark's a pastor and he's the one who's got it all right. And I want to look more like Mark so I can be a, so I can be a pastor to everyone. And God's saying, no, that's not what I want. God's saying, I want you to be you, but just a better version of you. God does not want, when he transforms us, to turn us into someone else. He's trying to make us the best that we are. He's taking everything that we are and taking the best bits and magnifying it and helping us to push aside the bits that are not so good. Do you know, when Paul started ministering for God, there were some things that did not change about him. He was still an expert on the law and he was able to argue it until the cows come home. And he could out-argue almost anybody. That's what he always could do. He was a leader. He got people to follow him. He took a group with him to try and destroy the Christians. Then he took a group with him to try and build new Christians. He stayed the same person. He was still a big picture person. He didn't just look at details and just go and help out here and there. He had a big picture, he had a big vision, and he was always moving towards the big vision. So he still had big visions that he moved to as he was, as he was leading his life as a Christian. He was always a teacher. He was trained under Gamaliel, one of the big teachers, and he was teaching other people. He still was that. He was still a teacher. I tell you what, he wasn't before and after becoming a Christian. He was never a pastor. His pastoral methods were not quite, well, probably wouldn't get through a lot of Bible colleges with some of his methods. Um, yeah, uh, Barnabas says, look, we're about to go on a trip. Uh, let's take uh, John Mark with us because uh, he had a bit, few problems, but he's now ready to serve God again. Hey, no way. We can't trust him. He's not good enough. And that was kind of like, and in fact, he argued with him so much, they split off and went different ways. He was not pastoral. He sometimes didn't get over problems. But he still was enough to go on and serve God. His ministry was not pastoral, picking up individual people and working with them. His was the big picture, talking to crowds and building crowds. And so if your ministry is you're a one-to-one -one person, then God's going to use you as a one-to-one -one person. He's going to transform you into someone who works very well talking on the one-to-one -one with other people. But if you're the type of people like me who's best standing up on a platform with a big mouth, it doesn't say I'm good at it, it says I'm better at it than one-to-one, -one, okay? Then that's how God's going to use you. You've just, what I'm saying is if God wants to use you and transform your life, make you more effective, it's not going to be about making you someone you're not. It's about taking who you are and building on it and transforming it into something better. In the words of this church, in you and me, God wants to build bigger people with bigger lives. That's our calling. That's what we should be doing. We should be transformed into people who are builders. We should become builders so we can build other people who will build other people, who will build other lives. So how's he going to do that in this? Well, as I said, as you move and feel better in God, you're going to be more positive about the future. It's going to be moving you towards building. He's going to lead you to pray into areas you will be good at and enjoy. He's actually going to lead you. He's actually going to tell you, yeah, that's a good idea. Or sometimes, no, that really isn't a good idea. There's been some stuff in my life where I thought, I'm not sure whether to do this, and I've just felt God saying no. That's leading. The word no is as much an answer to prayer as the word yes. That's how God's going to help you to build. He's going to put you into situations where you can build, not, not uh, situations where you can move bricks around. Because I'd rather be building them rather than stacking bricks in a different order. I tell you what, as you spend more time with God, as God's trying to make you more attractive to others, you're going to make some mistakes. Let me promise you this. No one here is going to make zero mistakes for God. Okay? 
But if you're spending time with God and you're letting God build you and letting God make you more attractive to other people, you're going to be learning. You're going to learn from your mistakes. But as he's doing that, he's going to build the fruits of the Spirit in you. That love, joy, peace, thankfulness. All of that stuff from God is going to be built into you. And that's how God's going to make you a builder, because he's going to transform your heart to see, be more positive, give you the fruits of the Spirit. And guess what? We talked about it a little bit last month. Did anyone mention the Holy Spirit last month, Mark? I think somebody preached it once last month. Unstoppable power of the Holy Spirit will come through us. And unstoppable power comes into our lives, transforms us and goes out, transforms those around us. The power of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> that's going to let people know there's a God working through us. So how does that make us attractive to other people? I'm going to tell you, people are drawn to success. Yeah? If you see somebody who's successful at what they do, and you see somebody who's a bit of a nutter and never seems to work whatever they do, who are you going to follow? The successful one. I tell you what, if, God, if you start to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, praying for people and seeing healing, bringing a word of knowledge, whatever it is that God uses you for, you're going to get noticed. That's going to draw people. But I tell you what, if all you do is pray for people and see gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's not going to make you attractive to other people so much as that's going to draw them to look at you. But what's going to draw them to stay, to stay with you is the, is the fruits of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. But it doesn't start off with um, desire the spiritual gifts and then follow love. It's follow love, then desire the spiritual gifts. As you move towards caring for people, that's going to make people want to come to you and talk to you and listen to you. God wants to transform you into somebody who's unstoppable. Do you think you can be? Coming to the end now, I want, to I want to remind us all, God is in the business of changing us, transforming us. We're in the changing room, but there are some bits we've got to say yes to. Number one, we've got to give God permission to transform us. Are you ready to give God permission to touch into your life, or do you like yourself? If you don't give God permission... He's not going to get anything done. Two, you need to work with him. God can push his way through, generally doesn't. He lets us get ready to move and work with him. Three, being transformed, it's not going to take away who you are. It's going to take the best of what you are and build on it. Doing stuff for God is not as important as spending some time with him. The time with him is going to be what makes the difference. And as God transforms you, I can give you one major promise. You will be transformed for the better. So I want to ask the question, do you want to be transformed? Do you want to be transformed by God? If you're saying, God, I'm ready to be transformed, I want you to take over in my life. I want to spend some time with you. I want you to talk into my life. I want you to make me what you said I can be, not what I am now. If that's you and you're saying, I'm ready for it, God, I want to work with you and I want to give you permission to move. I just invite you to stand up now. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that we are in the hands of a loving, caring parent who wants the best for us. And everything in this changing room, this transformation, is a gift. It's a positive gift from you. And Lord, we stand here before you and say, God, we're making ourselves available to you to do what you want to do. Lord, we want to become the person you've called us to be. Lord, we give you permission to build on the strong parts of our life. And Lord, to help us to walk away from the bits that are causing problems. Lord, we give you the permission. We want to be what you've called us to be. Come Holy Spirit. 
Come fill us. Come transform us. We give you permission. Amen.